So Scott, I guess, started his professional life in Virginia. Uh, bachelor's degree in civil and environmental engineering from Virginia Tech. Uh, spent a few years as a geo-environmental engineer, then came to Colorado. Started at the School of Mines. Uh, got both his master's and his PhD there. Uh, in electrical and elect sorry engineering systems and applied optics, um, worked for a year I guess uh, for Zolo Technologies here in Boulder, and then uh, started in NCAR in 2002. He's been both uh, an optical engineer and now is a research engineer here with e in EOL. Uh, he's got a whole list here of. Uh, basically has had his finger in every optical system that EOL has done for the past 10 years or so, uh, including uh, a high energy eye safe LIDAR for air visualization of aerosols and thus also winds, uh, Raman shifter for uh, high pulse energy LIDARs, uh, high spectral resolution LIDAR to get aerosol and cloud properties, an eye safe LIDAR for uh, horizontal wind, doing horizontal wind profiling, holographic imaging system for cloud particles, multipass cell for trace gas detection, uh, going on and on. And uh, today he'll talk about uh, the water vapor lighter. Thanks. Okay. So uh, today I want to talk about um, this is a LIDAR, uh, so Steve was mentioned, I'll, I'll mention that we, I do a lot with uh, lasers and optics, and this particular is a LIDAR for doing tropospheric measurement of water vapor. Um, now to be useful, just this is like the mission creep that always happens, right? Uh, this really needed to be low cost, it needed to have high vertical resolution, and it needed to make continuous measurements. So I'll start with a, sh a shameless plug for lasers applied to science. Um, Lasers uh, are versatile research tools, and they underpin a lot of the many key technologies in the last 50 years. Um, I think I can figure out a point. This is um, somewhat similar to what we do. This is uh, the Curiosity Mars, Mars rover. It uh, sent out a pulse of light, blasted a little bit of rock. This was a technique called LIBS, laser-induced um, breakdown laser-induced breakdown spectroscopy. So it incandesced a little piece of the rock, so it saved them from having to uh, drill holes, and they could identify the elements in the rock. Um, laser cooling, that was a huge one in terms of being able to do laser trapping that allowed us to actually, for the first time, measure the fifth state of matter, the Bose-Einstein condensate. That was a Nobel Prize. Um, laser guide stars, uh, spectroscopy, which I'll talk about, uh, atomic clocks. This one I hesitated to put on here a little bit is the National Ignition Facility. I know people may think that that's maybe a waste of money, but it's an interesting uh, uh, endeavor, and they get to play with really cool lasers, so it makes a good picture. Um, a little closer to home, we've done uh, applied lasers to science in very different ways. I'm going to give two examples of what we've done. Uh, this is the laser air motion sensor. It's installed on, in this picture, installed on the G5. And what we do is we send a laser out in front of the aircraft in the undisturbed flow portion. And we make a measurement. It's a Doppler shift measurement. So we let some of the light come scattered back from aerosols. We mix that with a little bit of what we've transmitted. And we end up getting a beat note on the detector. And that beat note is proportional to the wind speed. This has been um, advanced. The, this, in this case, this is just showing one single line of sight. And it's advanced our ability to measure true airspeed uncertainty by an order of magnitude. We're now at a tenth of a meter per second, where traditional methods were at uh, a meter per second. Somewhat unexpected, Al Cooper took this instrument and then showed that he could improve the pressure uncertainty and the temperature uncertainty by a factor of two to three as well. Uh, so that was a really nice, um, unexpected result of this laser application. Uh, another very different method is holography that Steve mentioned. This is a device that's called Holodeck. I'll very quickly talk about uh, roughly how this works, is you, you end up generating uh, 
a fairly large sample volume here by just having a, a, a 355, so a UV laser. It is looking at, in this regime, it's just a plane wave. When you have a particle in the middle of the plane wave, you'll get an interference pattern out at some distance. That interference pattern is a hologram. So you can then numerically reconstruct from that hologram back to where that particle was and what its size is. What that means for when we then take this instrument we fly through clouds is we can make on centimeter scales uh, images of the cloud volume. So in a single shot be able to get a statistically relevant sample of a cloud. We can get thousands of particles of clouds uh, cloud droplets and be able to bend their sizes and be able to understand something like uh, this is a cloud where it has um, somewhat diluted and more spatially uniform and then we can start to see some filamentation that's occurring in the cloud as it dissipates. So now we're going to take laser uh, techniques and apply them towards what has been somewhat of a long-standing problem of trying to understand the, distrib the spatial distribution uh, and temporal distribution of water vapor. So water vapor is important. I don't need to tell the, the, the crowd that uh, it influences the dynamic and physical processes that drive weather phenomena, uh, general circulation patterns, radio transfer, and the, the global water cycle. And so we need to have a better understanding of its spatial and temporal um, distribution, which would support these areas of research that I, I've listed here, and it would also improve the weather forecast community in terms of being able to better predict mesoscale and uh, quantitative precipitation. So there's been a long history of uh, what, a need for water vapor, continuous water vapor profiling, but recently there has been a call from two National Research Council studies in particular observing weather and climate from the ground up in 2009 and it called for water vapor profiling as one of the top four uh, gaps in our in our measurement capabilities and although that map does not have 400 points the study suggested 400 locations across the US where we had continuous vertical high resolution profiles of water vapor and so that changes the regime in terms of what measurements uh, are available out there, and it kind of pointed us in a direction on what needed to be developed. So here's what accurate measurements, uh, here are several instruments that make accurate measurements of water vapor. Radio sons and satellites combined are the backbone of what we use to do weather forecasting right now, but SONs being released twice a day don't provide that continuous measurement that's needed. Satellites don't do very well close to the ground surface. They don't provide very high resolution uh, in the vertical dimension, although they provide global coverage. Um, the microwave radiometers and the infrared radiometers are very good instruments in the boundary layer close to the ground. They do really well. Um, but as you get up to two and three kilometers, they start to, the, the resolution starts to get coarse. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about the infrared radiometer later. Uh, GPS receivers provide a nice measurement, a uh, nice column measurement of water vapor, but they don't, or precipital water vapor, and, but they don't do any range resolution. So active remote sensing right now provides really the best high resolution and continuous measurement. And generally that's done with a Raman lighter, but these instruments have been traditionally expensive to build, operate, and maintain. And when we start talking about uh, wanting to put 400 of them out there, then cost starts to become a factor. I'm gonna go into a little more detail on how a Raman lighter works and why it's costly. Um, if we look most, let's see if I can get my cursor over there. Most Raman lighters operate at 355. This is in the ultraviolet, so I'm, I'm showing you wavelength as a function of backscatter coefficient. So most of that light comes back from rarely scattering. That's the, so you send the wavelength out, it's elastically scattered, you get the same wavelength back. The great thing about Raman LiDAR is you at much lower, although much lower, you get information about several of the different gas constituents, oxygen, nitrogen, and water vapor all at the same time. The issue is you need to have a very powerful laser because this is five orders of magnitude down from what you would get just from that Rayleigh backscatter. What we want to do is use this signal 
and then turn the laser way down, and that allows us to use semiconductor lasers, which are inherently much lower cost. They operate for a much longer period without maintenance. They're tiny. There's a, not a giant pencil, very tiny. Here's the laser, here's the amplifier. These are tiny little things, they're low cost. That could possibly enable a network to use these types of laser systems. Now, they also still need to be made eye safe because we're talking about leaving something unattended. Uh, we want to have un unattended operations, which means reliable um, and low maintenance, and these fit the bill for that. The problem is they're very difficult to generate any photons with these devices. They're um, much smaller, and I'm, I'll talk about why that's a problem. The other part is because you're barely putting any photons out, you have to do a very careful job of engineering the receiver to block all the daylight because making a precise measurement in daylight, especially when there's bright clouds, becomes a real problem. So the method that we're going to look at is, uh, I'll start with just explaining a little bit about water vapor spectroscopy. You can see here, so this is uh, showing wavelength from the ultraviolet out to the mid-infrared. Water vapor is really good at absorbing lots of different bands. That's why it's such a good greenhouse gas. Uh, the most dominant greenhouse gas is because it has these enormous bands. Uh, this band right here at six microns is due to that bending band mixed with all these rotation bands, uh, modes up top. This is the fundamental. So what, what I'm plotting here is line strength. This, these are the very strongest lines of water vapor. The uh, next band down is combined, these stretching, there's an asymmetric and a symmetric stretch you see there in the bending bands. When those are combined with rotation modes, the, all these abil there's all these lines that can absorb uh, infrared radiation. And then as we start to go down into the near infrared, these are the regions we, we can target with these semiconductor lasers. In particular, if we zoom in a little bit more, down to the 0.8 micron or the 800 uh, micron band. This is the region that I want to zoom in in. This is what the instrument uses, uh, lines in this region. So if we zoom all the way down, and now we're just looking at a few absorption bands. Um, this one in particular is the one, one we, we want to look at. So this gives some insight into why this measurement is a little bit harder than a Raman, is now you have to have something that is frequency agile. We want to transmit a frequency very pure without any side bands, on this, we'll call this online because it's being absorbed. And then we move over here and we alternate and we transmit another wavelength that would not be absorbed or partially absorbed. The difference, these, these are absorption cross sections. And you can see from the equation on the bottom that the, this is a direct measurement of the number of water vapor molecules in the air. This is the absorption cross section from the online, absorption cross section from the offline. This is the difference, the range difference, which is just going to be a function of time we look at and measure the number of photons that come back as a function of range for that online frequency, that offline frequency. So this is not new. This is a differential absorption LIDAR. It's called DIAL. So it's, it allows us to use the uh, elastic backscatter, which is a bigger signal, but it does require a laser that has a little more agility than a Raman system. So this idea to do this with uh, a semiconductor system is a fairly old idea. In 1993, Reagan et al. proposed the idea. They wrote a conference paper. They made it look fairly easy. Uh, so that meant that it was six years later before someone actually came close to doing it. Um, it was, again, the, the folks at University of Arizona and a company called SESI. They put together the first breadboard of a micropulse. So there's these really small pulses and being able to do this technique. They did not use a diode laser, so they ended up using a, a, a chromium Lycath laser, which is a, sort of an exotic and expensive laser. So it wasn't until Mike Hardesty's group at NOAA, Janet Mackle, in 2004, they were the first to demonstrate that this could be done. They built an instrument uh, and wrote a paper in 2004. Um, this instrument uh, put out a very small amount of light, about uh, a milliwatt, and it only worked at night. It was the research done at Montana State University. They sent out a series of papers from 2009 through 2012, where Amin Nareer and Kevin Rapaski really worked at the transmitter. That was their main focus. Um, and they improved that by a factor of almost 70 in terms of being able to put out more photons with these types of systems. 
in 2011 we started collaborating with them because we saw that they had made the first daytime clear sky measurements and we wanted to partner with them and then help the technology along and really make it suitable for the atmospheric science community. So this is the Gen 3, so they had three papers. This is their last generation instrument. There were a couple things when we first met with them that they realized they wanted to change immediately. The system only worked when you had the PhD attached to it, so it didn't work uh, real well in terms of letting, letting it be an unattended device. They used lasers that were called ECDLs, that's external cavity diode laser. Um, the, the grading, that's the part that allows it to be very spectrally pure, is external to that. So it picked up all kinds of things. When the temp room temperature changed, you'd get this big hop in frequency. Uh, so one of the things we did was we partnered with a company to develop ones where that, that grading, this spectral uh, purity that's so necessary for the, the dial technique was put inside the laser. Um, we made DBR lasers, uh, and that stands for distributed Bragg reflector, but all that, all you need to think about is now inside the package, uh, something that's very easy to temperature control, so now the system could run for several days without having these mode hops. So that was an important first step. The other thing is that the folks at Montana had been too successful at turning the power up. Their system was no longer iSafe. So we had to re-engineer fairly quickly. Uh, what, you, what ANSI allows you to do is you have a certain, we actually, you can only uh, transmit about half a milliwatt per square centimeter. So, so if you exceed that, you just end up expanding the beam. And that's what we've done here. So we've expanded this beam. Now we've got a larger beam. It's now iSafe. So now this could be fielded unattended and actually run autonomously. And this allowed us to evaluate this technology. We took this to, uh, first it operated in Montana, then we brought it down here. We brought it to the East Coast at Howard University. We got some data there, uh, really fought with the alignment of the system there, and then finally brought it to uh, Dallas-Fort Worth, and that's where these results come from. And I just want to show this as a baseline for this Generation 3B instrument. I'm going to show a lot of data like this, so I'm going to go through this a, a little more carefully. What these are is on the top, I always show aerosol profiles. That's just something that comes back out of the instrument. It's interesting to be able to see the aerosol profile as a function of time. Now we're looking up to 12 kilometers in range. Cirrus clouds here, there's some low. Uh, cumulus clouds lower, and you can see some Virga that's uh, at the end of this time period. In the middle panel is the water vapor. That's what we're interested in. Um, and then on the bottom here are just the background counts. I don't want you to really be able to care about the counts so much, as, but when you see this come up, it helps you realize that this is daytime. Uh, when the background comes up high, we're at night, daytime again. You could tell that as well from this massive intrusion and in our ability to make the measurement of the water vapor during the daytime as well. So let's take a look at how this compared with some of the songs. Here are a couple nighttime, very early, uh, morning maybe uh, to right at the edge of the transition here of day to night. And the, these uh, soundings here are shown in blue and then the water vapor dial is shown in red. You see we get pretty good agreement except for um, below a kilometer. There's a pretty big dry bias that occurs in, in both of these soundings and this was pretty typical of our tests. Uh, when we look at daytime, it's not as attractive you're really looking at a two kilometer limit and maybe a one kilometer before you, you run into that dry by. So now you're not having much overlap, not very good agreement with the SONs uh, in daytime. And really, I want to point out one of the, the major limitations of this instrument is when you had bright daytime clouds here, you drop the ability to make the water vapor measurement altogether. A lot of that had to do with the fact that this is about where these photon counters that we use are saturating. It's not able to make the counts fast enough, and so it's certainly not going to be able to tell you whether or not you've had any attenuation due to, to water vapor. It's just, it's pegged. So we spent uh, some time after looking at this data, we got together with uh, the atmospheric scientists here and said, what's really missing? Obviously, we want to see down lower. We want to be able to see up higher in daytime. We don't want to just mo lose all the information that's uh, happening whenever there's clouds present. Um, so we spent six months redesigning s the system, and I'm going to walk through s four of the main changes we made and then show you some results. 
so one of the first things we did since we had to make the system i safe in a hurry is to really do it right and so now we change this um, to use the the telescope to transmit an eye safe beam this is a much more optomechanically stable way to make this um, system eye safe one of the things we had to do since we're using semiconductor lasers is we had to shape the beam to do this we use axicons which actually turn the beam into uh, what looks like a donut that allowed us to efficiently pass this and in most optical telescopes there's a secondary mirror which creates an obscuration so we wanted to avoid that so we shift all our energy to the outer part and we send out a ring this was a very efficient way and then optomechanically stable way, and I'll explain that in the next slide. So here is a cartoon showing the 3B instrument, and you can see we're sending the laser out into the field of view, which is shown in gray. Um, and in this case, we're doing it before the telescope. So just a little bit about alignment for, for LIDAR, these are very narrow fields of view. In order to not collect a lot of background light, they have to be quite small, about 100 microradians. So that's 0 0.006 degrees. It's a small target. Uh, LIDARs and, and a lot of optical instrumentation tends to be really great thermometers. These mounts move when temperature changes. So what happens is when you have a system like we had before and you get a change in temperature, the beam points and it walks out of the field of view. You're no longer capturing any of that light back. The difference now by doing this com combination before the telescope is any of those beam rays that are um, angled because of a mirror change are mitigated by the telescope. That magnification of the telescope 20 times gives us a 20 times more stable. We can get 20 times more movement here and it ends up still staying within our field of view. So that was the first change we did. The second is in order to see down lower, we added a, a second channel that had a wider field of view. And I'll explain why that was necessary. Uh, here's the transmit beam shown in green, and then the receive beams are shown in yellow. What we had before was this w narrow field of view that I talked about, and now we're adding a wider field of view channel. That allows us to collect more photons down close to the surface. Here's some data collected from those two channels. The normal channel in red is that long range channel. We can see that it starts to roll off in terms of the number of counts returned down to the ground. In green, I know that's hard to see, uh, we're picking off that 10%, but it ends up collecting more light down close to the ground. So, why? This is just a ray trace plot showing those two channels. So what I'm plotting here is uh, the beam size at the detector, this is just simple optics. Here's the size of the detector for this near field channel, oh, sorry, the far field channel. We use a slightly larger detector size here for the near range channel. But by having a narrow field of view, what happens is the beam size gets blurred as it comes in and you end up not collecting the light very efficiently down low. So our statistics get really poor down low. Redesigning this and opening it up allows us to now, so now we're collecting light from three kilometers up in the far field channel and able to collect all of the light down to 500 meters in the near field channel. That comes with some problems though, because I had mentioned already that opening up the field of view, or that we're already photon limited, opening up the field of view is gonna let more light in, which means that this channel, although it should be able to see lower, is gonna be noisier. Uh, it's four times wider, but the it goes by the square, so we're actually gonna have 16 times more noise in this channel. So that was change number two. Uh, going to the next uh, modification we did, I'm gonna go back to this slide and show, here's our two frequencies, our online, our offline, and I just want you to hold those in your, in, on the screen here and think about, now these two frequencies are coming back in the receiver. I'm gonna overlay them on the optical band pass. So these are, uh, optical filters are made by putting very thin layers of dielectric material down on a substrate of glass. This is as narrow as you can make these. This is absolutely state of the art. Uh, it's about a half, well, yeah, about a half a nanometer wide. It's very narrow, very good at blocking the wavelength. But you can see I've also added this dashed line. They also, unfortunately, are very angle sensitive because what happens as you tilt the rays is 
they see longer paths through the interference filter. And so what happens is the interference filter is blue shifted. To explain why that's an issue with a LiDAR is those rays that are coming back, here is the angle at the filter, again, just doing a ray trace, looking at the range. When you start to look at off-axis rays, let's look at 600 meters, the, the angle of the beam coming through your receiver now is tilted, which causes that, that shift. This becomes an issue when you're trying to do an online and an offline measurement and your filter is sliding sideways, you're going to end up getting a bias. That's part of the problem we had making the measurement down at low ranges. So in order to correct for that, we made a much wider filter that had a flat top. Again, this is state-of-the-art filter design in order to get that flat top and steeper sides. Here's that same amount of blue shift, but now it doesn't affect this ratio. Okay, so that's great, but now we have a problem. We we're letting in more light, so we added an etalon to that. An etalon is a polished piece of glass that lets in just fringes now. So we're going to overlay this blue curve with these green curves now, and when we do that, we're going to get a bandpass filter that looks like that. This is really nice. We can transmit our online and our offline frequencies in two sides of this filter, and it does a really good job of blocking the daytime. So lastly is the system that the, the 3B system that we had generating uh, the way it generated photons before is it would send out light for three seconds. It would wait for buffers to clear for another three seconds, and then it would capture light again on the offline for another three seconds. It was a really nice uh, switch design they had come up with because it was all fiber coupled. It was very robust, but the problem was that you only were operating at, a, at about a 60% duty cycle. So we went with much faster optomechanical switches and increased that time. So now that we were collecting light at 100% duty cycle, and here's what the system looked like when we were all done. So we're using the DBR lasers that we had installed with the 3B system. Here's a series of switches that allows us to interleave. So we want to do uh, as fast an interleave leaving as possible so that the atmosphere is frozen between making that measurement of on and offline. Uh, we do the amplification. This is, a, this is really the main part that's uh, remaining from the Montana State work is they had really made this efficient. This generates that this is CW light coming in at this point, and this generates it into that pulse. So we can do our range gating. So we get a nice pulse amplification that occurs in this tapered semiconductor optical amplifier. We shape the beam into a donut so it can pass through the telescope nice and efficiently. It comes back through the system. Here's our etalon and filter pair that does a really good job of blocking the background light. Now here's our near field channel that's got that wide field of view and our far field channel. That's more traditional and is going to really be the workhorse for, for daytime. So at the end, we were able to make a, a system that was 20 times more stable and iSafe. Uh, it operates, it switches back and forth between the frequencies 600 times faster. It has one and a half times higher transmission efficiency and it has 18 times better background suppression. So those were the, the four things we changed, and then converting the engineering specs into how is that going to play out into atmospheric science is, well, the first one, not so much, but it's going to allow us to leave the instrument alone. This is what it looks like now. This is the Gen 4 instrument. Um, but it is going to enable us to make measurements closer to the ground. It's going to enable us to make daytime, cloudy measurements, and then reduce errors, especially when we've got a changing background. So to get some insight into the differences, I'm going to go back to this system as it stood back in uh, September of 2012. That's the Gen 3 system operating at 33-minute temporal resolution. And compare it with what the system looked like right when we were completing it. We're now running at 10-minute resolution. Um, one of the first things that you can see is the background here has been suppressed more than an order of magnitude. That allows us to operate in daytime. Here's a region, just to compare as, as best you can qualitatively. Um, we've got high cirrus in this case. We're getting a fairly big daytime intrusion that's happening in the aerosol profile, only being able to measure about two kilometers. And we know we've got this dry bias, which you can actually see in the data as well that's occurring. Roughly same type of conditions, high cirrus, 
now we're saying no intrusion in the aerosol profile we're able to measure to four kilometers and what appears to be a little bit more uniform to the ground we took this system to frappe on june july and august of twenty fourteen here's some pictures from that deployment the water vapor dial was in this trailer right here here is the bao tower this is a kind of a neat shot of the p3 flying by uh, that was taken from roughly where this this photo was taken as well here's the instrument here's the water vapor dial in the sea container in this this is a trailer from the university of wisconsin inside of that was a airy so the, an infrared radiometer and we i'll show you some inner comparisons between that and some sons so here's the gen 4 performance at frappe um, this is it operated for 50 days unattended and it had more than a 95 percent uptime so that gave us a lot of confidence that the system is robust uh, reliable i'm now showing up to 14 kilometers in the aerosol data up top and you can see that there's lots of clouds in this in this period some serious clouds formed up here a lot of variability in the amount of aerosols that are coming back this was the really exciting part is now i'm just showing you water vapor for the lowest seven kilometers this we're able to now see that we're making measurements in daytime up to the base of the clouds. This was a really important achievement. There's a lot of variability in the water vapor, uh, a lot of structure vertically, a lot of changes temporally as well. So if we zoom in on a period here, uh, there was, this is a three-day period where we had a lot of sawn launches. It gives us a, an ability to quantitatively compare the two instrument techniques. So zooming in now to that three-day period, I'm now showing you one minute resolution on the bottom here. And at this resolution, which is interesting because that's about what uh, LAZE does, if you're familiar with that, that's an airborne uh, water vapor instrument. That starts to open up the possibility of taking this type of technology and moving it towards an aircraft. It is small, light, potentially opening up the ability to do uh, UAV work with, with something like this. I'll touch on that a little bit more later. Um, but here you can see we're making measurements right up to the cloud base. And uh, let's take a look at how it performed with SONS. There were six SONS that were launched here that I'm showing by these six dashed lines here. So here are the first uh, three profiles. Again, the SOND is shown in blue. Now we've got a near field channel, which is in green, and a far field channel in red. <laughs> There's quite a, a, a strong change in the absolute humidity here, and we're tracking that quite well with the first three songs, getting very good agreement from roughly 300 to 500 meters above the surface up to four kilometers in daytime. This is daytime cloudy conditions. This is about as hard as it gets. This is nighttime, and you can see we're actually getting pretty much the same agreement between the, the wide field of view and the narrow field of view channel, which is what we would expect. Looking at the next three in the time series here we're tracking that doubling of from six grams per cubic meter to 12 grams per cubic meter and so it's comparing very nicely with the sons now they are looking at different volumes so there, there will be some differences um, before going on to look at whether or not there were any systematic biases i just wanted to point out that so here was an opportunity to get multiple sons um, even at that high spacing, you would not have any idea what was going on with the structure here in the water vapor. This is really a nice image of what a continuous um, profiler can, can, can offer in terms of new information. So to see whether or not there was any systematic bias, we looked at all of the SONs for the entire project. There were 43 of them. 41 were daytime. This is when we expected to have uh, the most trouble. So this is a really nice conservative case. And you can see that this is the mean relative error, and it is less than 10% for all the SONs from 300 meters up to 4 kilometers. We're getting a little bit of, I believe, systematic bias from background that's coming in from this near field channel. It's not evident at nighttime, and so that's probably uh, an indication that, that that field of view needs to be narrowed down a little bit. So there were some interesting cases during Frappe where we had very sharp features in, in the uh, water vapor profile. 
Obviously, a song's not going to do much good to, to launch at this time. You maybe have 20 seconds, but it's really just a snapshot. It would be very difficult to compare uh, a song launched at that location, what, what happened. Um, so this is where using the ARI comes in very handy. Uh, there's a very nice uh, rise in, in moisture that occurs over these three days. There's some fog that's occurring right here that you can see in the aerosol. That's what's limiting our ability to make the measurement of water vapor here, low-level clouds. Um, so some clouds are evident right uh, here after the 24th of July. Something dramatic happens here, and it's nice to get some validation that ARI sees the same thing. Um, now, ARI has been, is actually using uh, the cloud base from the dial, which is, which is great, and I think there's a lot of synergy between these two instruments. Uh, they're both, not only is the ARI measuring water vapor, but it's also measuring temperature. Temperature is one of the things that could be fed back into the water vapor dial to help make that more accurate as well. So Dave Turner and Tammy and I will be looking at the synergy between these two instruments in the future. So to, to wrap it up and think about uh, the future, what, is this, what does this technology hold? If we were to use it just like it is now on the ground base, uh, Ned has asked me, how fast can you make the measurement? So to try to understand that, we've done some performance modeling. And what I'm showing here is a performance model shown in relative error. And I'm drawing a red line here to say, we're going to ignore everything that's higher than a 10% error. How far up can we see? And now I'm looking at three different time periods, 10 minutes, one minute, and 10 seconds. So the red here is the far range channel um, at 10 minutes. Far range channel is the solid line. Near range channel is the dashed line. So here's 10 minutes. It shows that we can see to about two and a half kilometers at 150 meter range resolution. Um, this is a very, very conservative atmosphere. Uh, and what I mean by that is I pulled most of the aerosols out of the model. Not really typical of what we saw at Frappe, so I'll show a, a daytime performance where we've got more enhanced aerosols. The instrument sees light scattered back from molecules and aerosols, so this is a worst case. When we start to go down to one minute, this is more what we see is we're able to make these measurements at one minute time scales uh, for the lower two kilometers. 10 seconds, we would only be able to use the near field channel, but it sh does show that we would be able to make measurements on the order of 10 seconds for that lower kilometer. Now if I put the aerosols back into the model uh, for something more typical like the measurements we had at Frappe, now we're really being able to see a good uh, lower 10 kilometer, oh, sorry, that would be nice, lower kilometer um, being able to measure at 10 second time scale. So that sort of bounds what we could do as the system stands right now without increasing the, the aperture, without increasing the amount of power that we transmit. How fast can we go? about 10 seconds. Um, next is, I mentioned, what if we put this on a plane? So we can use this performance model to take a look at what, what simulated performance would be from an aircraft. So I'm simulating here again relative error, flying at five kilometers, pointing down. Now I'm just looking at uh, the two channels in the daytime here in blue and nighttime in black. This is the long range channel. Here's the near range channel. I don't know that we really need the near range channel because you can move your plane up and down, but it does show that you'd be able to make a nice profile at 300 meter range resolution and in 60 seconds. That's a, that's, uh, a, a nice outcome. It's actually a little bit easier to look down into the soup instead of trying to look up through it. Um, now if I add the aerosols back to that, you can see we actually could make a, a little bit better, higher resolution, 220 five meter, and I believe that we could get to 150 meter without having to change the instrument. Again, I'm just taking the instrument as it's on the ground and assuming somehow it, it's magically put on a plane and nothing's changed, but the, the technology is uh, very well suited to be able to make measurements on uh, 60 second time scales from aircraft. Uh, so to conclude and uh, summarize is we've built a, a next generation instrument that is, it's the first iSafe diode uh, laser dial that's capable of continuous measurements in all conditions from 300 meters up to four kilometers uh, or cloud base, whichever comes first with 150 meter range resolution. Some of the next steps is we plan to do some more inner comparisons with the infrared radiometer. Uh, we've had some internal funds to package this. This is, this is the uh, Cody. This was the one that was developed by NOAA 
long time ago. It's basically a rolling refrigerator, but it's a lot easier to take out in the field than something like uh, a sea container, which is what we fielded it in Frappe. So we're going to be building something like this, which will allow us to more easily field the instrument. Uh, we will be taking it to Pecan in the summer of 2005, uh, 2015. We have an application uh, for a patent. And uh, we are discussing, or we'll be beginning to discuss, how do we take what we've developed and turn it into something that really could be a network of instruments. That next step is, is likely going to be industrial through industrial partnerships that we would uh, help uh, have them help us along in, in trying to develop multiple units. But for the, the near field, uh, near or longer term future, we, we would like to build a small network. We would like to develop uh, the ability to do a temperature profiling channel to this, or uh, and we've got some work done on that. And then also, uh, the future can easily hold putting this technology on a UAV, or uh, or the G5 or another aircraft. So with that, I'd like to just acknowledge everybody who has helped with the water vapor dial development. Uh, we've had help at NCAR, MSU, and NASA Langley, and even the administrative staff helped launch SONS. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions for Scott? Now, you didn't say much about cost. Oh. When you get to uh, deploying it on a more or less operational basis, what would you estimate the, the cost of each unit would be? Yeah, ROM, uh, I can only talk in ROMs at the moment. Uh, but a, so a, a ROM aligner is going to be on the order of uh, a million. This would be 100,000. We're, we're thinking a tenth of the cost. Maybe it's 2 million versus 200,000. But the idea is that you could have 10 of these for every ROM and LiDAR system. And it would have a much lower uh, maintenance cost associated with that as well. Uh, how much power do you send to your two fields of view? You didn't really mention how much energy you send to the wide field versus the narrow field. 10% 10, 10 is sent to the, to the wide field of view right now, um, which is, is sufficient. But I would think in the next generation, we'd like to narrow the field of view, maybe bring that in by a factor of two, so we can make better daytime measurements with that. Um, but where, yeah, where total power we're sending out is 50 milliwatts. It's not a lot. I'm just wondering if if you have any sense of what the uh, uh, operational requirements the operational uh, entity like the Weather Service might have to get really excited about this. Is it is uh, so? Is the development to the point where the capability you have now is would would be enough to meet their needs, or is your sense that there's still further advances that need to take place there? Yeah, that's a good good question. I, I believe that uh, the technology now being able to see, now maybe you want to push a little lower than 300 meters, but being able to see from 300 meters to four kilometers, you're covering most of the water vapor. You're never going to be able to see with, a, with an infrared system at least. You're not going to be able to see through clouds. So seeing up to cloud base is as good as you're going to get. So um, you know, I think ballpark uh, that this is the technology is as, as good as it's going to get in terms of being a low-cost system. Um, you may be able to bring the, the temporal and the spatial resolution up a little bit as you improve the um, transmitter, but at a certain point you run into eye safety. So it's pretty close to, to I think, something that could be deployed in, in a national network. Uh, and I guess what would get them excited is, can you build it at a low cost, and at that point, that, that's where we'd have to partner with a, a commercial company. But I suppose the thinking would be that this would never be intended to replace the need for the uh, water vapor measurements on the SANS, that it would, yes. ju would just supplement them? Yeah, the ability to make measurements for this for long range, um, you know, seven, eight kilometers, there's very little water vapor. You, you can maybe make, we do make measurements occasionally up to seven kilometers. We can make measurements inside cirrus clouds. But I don't think you you wouldn't have the high resolution that you have from a son for especially up high. In all conditions. Correct. Can you 
move the line a little bit and look at water vapor isotopes there's not not a big population of the isotopes and so that would be the problem yes and so this is just by its fingernails being able to make this measurement and maybe in the future it'd be nice to be to be able to look at isotopes that's that'd be a lot easier with an inch of in-situ system generally laser remote sensing tends to focus on things like co2 or water vapor that there's a lot of or ozone and it gets harder to do isotopes nice seminar the 10% seems pretty large for the error characteristics and I was thinking back like to the old classic paper by crook that you need about a gram gram and a half of water vapor accuracy in the boundary layer to say whether convection is going to develop or not or its intensity is there any way to for accuracy to average longer than that to bring that number way down right well one of the reasons why I wouldn't hang my hat too hard too too much on that is we're not necessarily looking at the same sample volume um, with the sun and the dial so there there, there are some discrepancies that, that sneak in that way the other one is we have let's see if I can show you an example quickly if you look at when we run into a cloud as well and this gets into you can see in the, in the in the retrieval right now we're getting a, a spike of water vapor right there that causes some some of the error as well we know that that can be removed uh, in the future with some better signal processing so that that should help um, most of the papers that I've read in terms of being able to 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 be the limit in terms of what a, a water vapor dial system even with the really high power systems which were Thai Sapphire were five percent relative error and so I think that that's a reasonable goal to attain with a system like this as well. I think the European Center estimation of their calibration error for the water vapor measurements that go into the system is about 10 percent. So if you could get it down to five, that would be great, or 10, yeah, and, 10 and maybe you can live with. We're relying on uh, spectroscopic models as well, and so there can be error associated with that. Part of the which I didn't mention in, in this is uh, we, we did a lot more detail. We, we've improved our uh, model. So there's this a priori knowledge that you have to have. You have to know it really well. You also, that's going to be a function of temperature and pressure, although weakly uh, dependent on those. So the better we have temperature or pressure profiles, perhaps again, with, with merging the data with the area, again, you can bring that error down as well. Is the ten percent in uncertainty, or uh, does it have systematic bias aspects to it? Well, there doesn't seem to be any systematic bias in terms of we would expect a, a slope or something like that. But those are just how well does it compare to a sond, and are we looking at the same volume? Um, not necessarily. And there's a lot of changes, especially in this case that I'm showing right here. There's a there's a enormous changes in the water vapor as a function of time. Where is it gone? We know we know that there, uh, at least temporarily, there's there's very strong changes in the water vapor, and we don't know what that looks like spatially. It looks like um, the water vapor error bars increase below 300 meters, roughly. And uh, is there any way you can increase? Uh, the vertical resolution and accuracy near the ground. I know you have to give up something yes. in order to. So what happened if just uh, say concentrate on a lower, say two kilometers? Sure. And you, you, you can do that? Yeah, we've done, I didn't show any of that modeling, but we've looked at that. So one of the things right now is we're sending out a fairly long pulse and that's, that's making us have a hard 150 meter limit. But there's no reason why we can't send out a shorter pulse that cuts our so we give up something, cuts our energy in half, but if we we're only interested in the lower two kilometers, we could easily go to a 75 meter resolution. Um, nighttime, it makes it easy. If, if you're interested in, in doing nocturnal boundary layer and you really wanted to say stay closer to the ground, you could go into a mode at night where you open up the field of view. You could have a, a, a iris that actually controlled the field of view. Some ladder systems do that. Uh, to allow you to see closer to the ground. So right now we're not, um, and you can see from some of these models, 
what happens at the ground is you start to to lose it, it starts to wrap back on itself in terms of efficiency because you aren't collecting any photons. And so the only way to get photons close to the ground is to open up the field of views. That creates problems when you've got bright clouds, but at nighttime, that's a certainly acceptable thing to do. So at nighttime, um, how close to ground and uh, you can, can you measure it? And uh, what is the approximate the vertical resolution say for nighttime? Yeah, um, I don't know. I would I would think probably about 150 meters is probably the the limit, uh, a practical limit for from just engineering and uh, 75 meter range resolution seems very practical. If you wanted to push shorter than that, perhaps you'd have to really work at trying to increase the amount of pulse energy that you put out, um, which is which is possible. Some of the folks uh, that we're collaborating with at NASA they're looking at. At trying to get more energy out of the amplifier, and that would allow us to shorten that pulse even more. At lunch, we were talking about just increasing the vertical resolution by close to the ground by just tilting the beam. Yeah. Don has talked about why don't you just point sideways and look in a mirror and then look up. Um, it's, it's a matter of cost. Uh, if you look at um, Airy, I'm sorry, Cody, which was one of the, the first instruments. Um, here, they've got a, you've got a beam steering unit, so they actually just point the beam horizontal and they can change the angles. That um, probably would double the cost of the instrument, though. If it's really needed on uh, an instrument that's used for a more scientific research instead of a national network, maybe the cost is, is worthwhile to, to invest in having a scanner like that put on there. You certainly could do slant paths and horizontal paths since it's ISA. Now that you're using a transceiver design, do you worry about after pulsing off your window? Do you have any problems with isolating the outgoing beam from your no, electronics? No, uh, I didn't go into the details too much of that, but, but what we did is we, we have very good isolation between the outgoing and, and the return beam. We aren't using the full telescope. We're only using the inner portion of the telescope as As the transmitter, you see that the beam doesn't extend to the out. Here's the primary mirror. We're using the outer portion of the telescope as a receiver, the inner part as a transmitter, so they're completely isolated. They're physically isolated from each other, so we don't have after pulse in that way. Clever. You know, your 10% number, by comparing with the radio sound, I think you're probably better in the radio sun. Look at the amount of detail you had there. If the sun were, and the fact that the sun's not measuring exactly the same time and place, I not, wouldn't be surprised at all you'd get 10% differences. I'll let you say that. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> so I think your error is only 5%. Sounds good. <laughs> <clears throat> Comparisons the balloon in the uh, in the mid to upper troposphere. Remember, this thing goes to eight kilometers or so at least uh, in a, in a, at nighttime. Is uh, tens of kilometers away, and you see the structures of the water vapor vary so greatly. And the said. ten percent is buried in that. Yeah. Yeah, it would be it, it would be buried in something like this feature right here. Um, yeah. Which may I be mean, real. We, we really, we really don't know. Let's say the accuracy of the instrument in a uh, sort of um, homogeneous field of water vapor. Why couldn't you put a really accurate uh, temp, uh, humidity sensor on top of BAO and make a comparison? So the top of BAO is 300 meters. That would be our first range gate. That's my least favorite range gate, though, because that's the one that's noisy. I would like a tower about twice as tall, and then it would be a great. OK, okay put a mirror down. And there we go. <laughs> Angle towards it, maybe, yes. That would be, that would be nice. Yeah, Tammy wrote a nice paper years ago about the representativity error from the radio sons in a convective boundary layer. It is much, much larger than the problems associated with the sun measurement itself. Um, it would be nice to get it near a, a Raman or even uh, get some information on the satellite statistics for errors in the free troposphere um, down low. I'd sh 
surely think you'd beat it in free troposphere. And these Probably these too. these songs in particular that were launched in this uh, this was in the beginning of the project. These were ozone songs, and I did notice there's a little bit of a, a difference, a little bit of a bias between this and the Vaisala songs. And I don't know if that's normal, um, or it was just that this was changing so much, or the person from NOAA decided to to clock when they launched the song a little bit different. And uh, since we tend to we were kind of leading in each case, that could easily be a, a time difference as well. And, and when they actually released the song, and when they said they released it, um, so there's a lot of possible sources of, of uh, discrepancy between the two measurements. Yeah, another uh, possibility perhaps would be an airplane, which can circle around or be flown in some pattern that would give you a good comparison over a fairly good altitude window. Well, at, at, uh, so at Pecan, there will be Lays flying overhead. If we trust that Lays is correct, uh, that would be a great intercomparison as well. And I think more of the, the comparisons with the area are going to be really helpful as well in uh, nailing down some of the uncertainty. I think we've drilled Scott enough. We should probably <laughs> give him a bit of a break. So let's give Scott another hand.